Hey, Bill. Sorry, I was late. All good. Hey, good morning. How are you? Good. Okay. Got a nice little coffee chat going here, huh? Yeah. All right. Let me read. And we've got a cozy little group here. Awesome. So I take it away here, Jeremy, or what do you say? Yeah. So we'll go ahead and get going. But um, so meet Connie, David, and Lainey, but love to, you know, talk about your background, uh, you know, where you came from and, you know, uh, go from there. Yeah, sounds great. So my name is Bill Hershey. I met uh, Jeremy through his wife, Jen, actually. Uh, we were in the, what was that? The TAA, yeah. what does that stand for? Um, Trusted Authority Accelerator. There you go. It's been too long. Like yeah. one, you know, one year just feels like e multiple years these days. I don't know if yeah. I, can anybody relate to that. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, so that's how we met. Um, gosh, Jen, uh, you all know Jen. She's a powerhouse. And um, yeah, it, it, going through that program, actually, you know, I realized that that program is really designed for integrative health practitioners and not for business coaches. I got sold into that program as an Ayurveda graduate. Yeah. I was thinking like, okay, yeah, my dream is I want to start this Ayurveda business. And I was also, you know, helping people with their businesses as a bookkeeper and a business coach at the time. So I had a foot in both worlds. I realized later on that that's not the best fit for um, a business coach to be in that program, but it helped me become a better business coach and helped me really get clear on yeah, I think business coaching is really where I want to be empowering people who are helping the world heal, which we all can see the world needs, needs a ton of healing right now. And yeah. so I've been really intrigued in my work about this problem. The world's never needed you more than ever before, yet people are struggling to find clients. What's up with that, right? What's that about? It's a marketing problem, right? Mm -hmm. It's about getting our message out there in a way that's clear to people. So where I play in this field is I help people make money and manage money well. Uh, I help people on the number side of their businesses. I do strategy, coaching, accounting, and bookkeeping. But I find myself very much gravitated to scrappy entrepreneurs, people who are just getting started. And really, you know, most of my folks need help finding clients. So I play in that realm as well. What we're going to be doing today is what I call laying the energetic foundation for the business. So this will define, you know, this will give you a platform to stand upon as you develop your marketing strategy, as you develop your business model, as you begin to track the things that are important in your business, the metrics, the numbers, whether it's financial numbers or other numbers. So, um, Jeremy, I hope that gives you a little yeah. bit of an idea. I, I guess a couple other fun tips, or, or not tips, but fun facts about my life. I spent 15 years at a meditation retreat center here in rural Oregon, and I live in a forest, you know, out here in the middle of nowhere. I love it. Yeah. So, yeah, actually, Jeremy, you're, you you spent some time in in Oregon, so you you know yeah. this this part of the world. Yeah, and Connie spends half her time up in. Uh... By Lincoln City, right? Correct. Okay, beautiful. So y'all know the Pacific Northwest. Wonderful. So um and it was else? Cool. Medit meditation was cool in Oregon before it was cool anywhere else. I, you know, you know, I grew up at the Oregon Country Fair and uh there it is. Um, well, of course, uh the Bhagwan Sri Rajneeshi. <laughs> right. Yeah, unfortunately, <laughs> notorious. Our organs become notorious in some ways. <laughs> but uh yeah, I, I actually grew up in Buffalo, New York, and I I you know I found Oregon when I was 22. And I was like, man, I don't think I can leave. Yeah. So yeah, wonderful. Well, uh any, anything else you think all y'all we should cover or shall we dive right in? Yeah, no, I, you know, I think it's, I think it's a really cool, cool topic. So yeah, let's jump right in. Okay, cool. So I'm going to give credit where credit is due here. I took an accounting program with one of the influencers uh, in the accounting world. His name is Mark Wick Wickersham. He specializes in pricing and creating business models for accountants. And he gave us his permission as accountants to kind of share this 
information in our fields. As long as I'm not teaching other accountants, we're good. So I modeled this after him. I've adapted it. I've brought in things that I've brought in from other training. So this is like core business building, business development. But really where this starts is, and this is where I think a lot of people miss people a lot of people miss this out or <laughs> leave this out excuse me if i'm you know am i talking english am i, do I let's let's review the grammar rules here yeah. um it's worth taking the time to be deliberate and intentional about what we want to create in our business and the first question is what what do we want our life to look like Right. If we're building a business for the business sake, it's going to, you know, this monster is going to take a life of its own. Right. But if we have a really clear idea of what we want our lifestyle and as integrative professionals, you probably have an idea of self-care and how you want to be managing your work-life balance. That's all super important because that's going to make you an effective professional that you can live the thing that you're talking about with your people, you know, the lifestyle. So, you know, being really clear about the lifestyle that we want to lead. Um, before we start designing the business is key. And th that's really where this exercise starts. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, I didn't do a lot of business planning when I started my business. So I was like, okay, this will be easy. You know, just get some clients. You know, I know, I, you know, how many people can relate to that? Yeah. And honestly, well, I'm not about writing a 50 page business plan. I think that's overkill. And you know what? By the time you write a 50 page business plan, it's obsolete because you got updates and changes happening constantly, right? So what I'm going to give you here is a living, breathing document. It's a tool that you can perpetually use through the life cycle of your business. I use it quarterly. At the very least, you might use it at the beginning and end of each year. So to add a little bit more suspense, how many people here have heard of the reticular activating system? They get kind of like, I'm a nervous system geek. And I imagine some of you might kind of know some of the nervous system anatomy a little bit mm -hmm. reticular activating system who, who knows what that is <laughs> somewhat somewhat okay so this is this is this is cutting edge uh neuropsychology there's a part of our brain it's it's about the size of a little smaller than a pen it's actually like the width of a pencil it's like two inches right at the brain stem and what this does is it filters all the information that's constantly coming in through our senses. So through sight, most of it's through sight, some of it's through earring, then we have, you know, taste, touch, smell, all of that. Um, so as we evolved as human beings in the wild, you know, we evolved, you know, picking berries in the forest, finding berries in the forest, hunting for animals in the forest, right? Foraging. Mm -hmm. And we needed to have very tuned senses to filter out the things that aren't important in our environment and really hone our attention towards the things that are going to help us survive or you know for the procreation of our race we're going to be very attuned to you know someone who we might want to mate with right mm -hmm. so these are survival mechanisms that are built in that even though we're now living in modern society they still have a very relevant role in how um, our brain functions and how we get what we want in life. So it filters out things that are most important, right? How does it know what's most important? Repetition, the repetition of thoughts. If we constantly have this thought, ah, I need, I'm hungry, I need berries. Where are the berries? You know, it's like, we're gonna notice every little colored thing on every leaf that we see, right? Um, in the same way, in business, if we're really clear, on what it is we want, our attention will be tuned to finding that thing. And it's repetition, repetition that drives that in. So that's why I call this a living, breathing document. I, I invite you to come back and hone your vision on a quarterly basis. Has the vision changed a little bit? Has it become more clear in some ways? Have we scrapped it all together and we're pivoting and we're trying something else, right? So coming in, uh, one time exercise, I, I think it's still valuable, but the real value is in coming in and, and doing this repeatedly. So let's dive in, yeah? How many people here have um, done any kind of business planning or articulating your vision in any way? Maybe raise your hand or throw it in chat. 
Okay, so this this isn't totally new. And you know, this is you know, this is basic business moves. You know, what I'm going to share with you is not super fancy, but you know, when you learn a karate chop or a karate kick or a karate, you know, these these are all very basic things. But getting good at the basics, the fundamentals is really what brings you to the black belt level, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, here we go. So this is the vision planning worksheet. What I'm going to do is, I, I think this would be really valuable as an interactive uh, kind of workshop. I'm going to put the link in chat. Feel free to, if you got two monitors, uh, feel free to open that up in the second monitor. If you only have one, um, maybe pull up the dock and minimize the zoom window so you can kind of just see like a little square of me kind of guiding you through it. And, you know, you don't really even need to see me. If you can't see me, that's fine. It's like, I'll be talking you through it. And I'd invite you to even, you know, it, if you want to just go right to it, you can start writing some things down, writing down some quick notes in each of these sections. And, you know, after the call, you can go back, you can review the recording and you can uh, fill it out, even flesh it out even more. You might want to take an hour or two to really bring life to this document because it's going to bring life to your vision. Okay, so looking back and reflecting. When I coach my clients, I always start calls orienting to, I, I call it orienting to the positive. Uh, you'll, you'll see this in a lot of business coaching or, or business development circles, uh, celebrating wins. When I first heard of celebrating wins, I was like, you know, okay, that sounds nice, but, you know, shouldn't we be spending time like getting something done, right? <laughs> And it took me some time to realize the value of celebrating wins. There's something very valuable there. Number one, remember how we talked this up this, this reticular activating system? It works in repetition. So when we're reminded of those things that we're looking for, when we're celebrating something, we're reminding ourselves of that. We're not res just reminding of the image or the memory of it, but we're also enjoying that experience, that sensation, that emotion in our nervous system that's associated with that experience or that win, right? So in a way, in a way, we're training our nervous system how to win. We're training our nervous system that, yeah, we can get used to winning. It can feel good. We can get used to living in this flow, in this state of like, yeah, feeling a sense of agency that we can accomplish things. And, you know, we, every, everybody goes through periods, everybody goes through cycles. And the first time that I filled out this exercise, I was actually in a dry spell in my business. I was frustrated, feeling dejected, like, oh, man, I wasn't hitting my targets. Uh, I'd gone maybe three months without finding a new client. So, you know, I get bigger contracts. So finding a client's a big deal. It's a little more feast and famine with the work that I do. Um, so this was a couple of years ago. And I went through this exercise. And after, you know, this first part of celebrating wins, listing everything that you've accomplished in the recent year's activity. And if you're doing this on a quarterly basis, this would be the recent quarter's activity. That was therapeutic for me. I, you know, as I listed out the bullets, I probably had 20 plus bullets there of things that I had accomplished. It was my first year of business. This was uh, 2021. And that felt good. So you'd be surprised if you take a time, uh, take time, whether quarterly or annually to list these things out, maybe even a weekly or a daily basis, list out the things that you've accomplished if you're feeling frustrated. Um, if you really haven't accomplished anything, then okay, yeah, the frustration is there to maybe help gift you, spur you into action to get you moving, right? But um, it may also be a mindset. In my case, it was mindset. So this is sort of the antidote for that sort of, it's a mindset of lack or a mindset of scarcity. Like, oh, if, you're, if we're so focused on what we don't have and what we need Okay, being focused on what we need is one thing, but being focused on the energy of lack. Mm -hmm. uh, reticular activating system, what do you think it does? That repetition of thought, oh, I don't have this, I don't have this. What do you think it does? Yeah. Yeah? I think, I think this is such a great point. I mean, even personally for me, this was a challenge because mm. you get so bogged down in the day-to-day -day 
of, you know, that person who's complaining, you know, if you're a client, you know, that one client that may be your tr problem client that's creating a bunch of problems for you and you're trying to, you're only thinking about solving, you're not thinking about the people who have benefited. Uh, and it becomes kind of a self-reinforcement, you know, downward spiral, right? You forget about, you forget to acknowledge the accomplishments and the successes because you're so focused on problem solving and that becomes your mindset. There it is. Yeah. Well said, Jeremy. And, and, you know, when we're, we're really focused on like a difficult problem, a different part of our brain is engaged. We're in problem solving mode. It's almost like, so are y'all familiar with like the different states of the nervous system? Can, I, can anybody say them real quick or put them in chat? There's sympathetic and there's parasympathetic, right? So sympathetic is like the arousal, like, hey, I'm going to get going. I'm going to run a race. I'm in fight or flight or whatever it is, I, you know, get, get stuff done, right? And then there's parasympathetic. That, and there's two types of parasympathetic. There's shutdown, where like, oh, you know, I'm going to go dormant. I'm going to play dead. Or like, I'm frozen. I don't even know what to do. I can't even speak right now, speechless. So that's 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 one aspect of like uh, the parasympathetic, that's dorsal shutdown. But there's also uh, ventral, the ventral vagus, right? Y'all familiar with vagus, vagus nerve, not Las Vegas, but that's where we're in the flow state. It's like, we're socially engaged. Our face lights up, we're smiling, we're with people, we're creative, right? So in that flow state, that creativity, that's when we're actually most effective in problem solving, isn't it? So the more that we can live there, the better. And that's actually, you know, this process of celebrating wins is what reinforces being in that flow state. And, you know, Jer Jeremy, I appreciate you kind of just, you know, being vul vulnerable with the entrepreneurial struggle. We've all been there, yeah? yeah. And it's like, um, but this is a practice. You know, this is a daily, hourly, uh, you know, moment by moment practice to maintain this executive mindset mm -hmm. and and yeah well, stephanie stephanie actually focuses on autonomic stress uh is in her practice so oh hey how about that so th this is this is your playing field love it feel free to chime in here stephanie and any anybody at the if you have insights to share things that will reinforce reinforce what we're talking about i'm not a research geek you know that's not my that's not my game necessarily but if you have research like, hey, by the way, there's this amazing study that, you know, says exactly what you're saying here. I would love that. Throw it in chat. Yeah, yeah, I'll chime in. I'm a PhD candidate in applied psychophysiology. Beautiful. And I'm going to be starting a podcast where I fully claim the moniker HRV guru. Beautiful. HRV. Could you, what, is, what does that stand for again? HRV, heart rate variability. Uh -huh. okay. I'm a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and on a couple different presentations, they've said Stephanie is the HRV guru. So I'm going to grab that title and run with it. Love it. Love it. All right. The world needs you. The world needs all of you. Right. So, and, yeah. And I think I, I had a conversation with a, a family practice physician. Uh, and I think this, this is, unfortunately, I wish it was on because this, this exact conversation so she's been in clinical practice, struggling to attract clients, struggling to understand exactly um, who her target audience is and how to kind of value herself, not see it, you know, clearly not recognizing the impact she's had over the past three years, but mm -hmm. only thinking about, you know, I'm not doing it the right way. I have a scarcity mindset, all the other stuff. So this is, a, um, I think this is absolutely on spot on for how many how, how so many of our practitioners are struggling. They yeah. know that they want to be clinically clinically beneficial to society as a whole. They're just uncertain in terms of how they want to do that. What yeah. state is she located in, Jeremy? Florida. Good to know. Yeah, it's not easy. It's, you know, getting strategic, which is basically when you're declaring a target audience or a niche, that's very strategic. It's, it, it sounds simple, but it's not. You know, th this is deep hard work so i respect the struggle and you know it, just to kind of normalize it a little bit it can take two years mm -hmm. to get really clear and nail your niche what like where you're going to be playing the strongest you know where you can really be one of the best or the best in the country or the world at what you do for for that particular uh mm -hmm. group of people 
Okay, wonderful. So uh, reinforcing this even further, you know, acknowledging these wins is key, but then taking a step further, what did these wins teach you, right? What, what did you get out of that? This is going to reinforce and cement those lessons that you've gained. Mm -hmm. uh, so acknowledging that. In what ways have you changed personally in the recent year? You know, we, it's like, it's kind of cool that we all have a context. We, we all have iPhones. Like, I'll be honest with you. I just activated my iPhone yesterday. Wow. I've been able to live without a cell phone for 18 plus years, if you can believe that. Wow. Uh, but, but, you know, as, as an entrepreneur, this is going to make my life a lot easier in some ways. I'm, I'm you know, I, mean, I don't even get cell reception where I'm in here in the woods, but, <laughs> but it's necessary, you know, to, to be able to communicate with these people these days. But what do you have to do if you have a phone? You need to update it regularly, right? In the same way, our software, our, our mindset, sometimes we need updates because we're designed to conserve energy, right? And what that does, you know, being an autopilot is one way that our organism conserves energy. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just do what you did last time. It seemed to work okay, right? So to prevent us from falling into habits that are maybe outdated, it's a helpful practice to acknowledge verbally with friends and accountability groups or with you know, partner, or, or even you know, in this exercise we're documenting on paper, how have we changed? How is the bill from 2022 or 2021 different from the bill in 2023? How am I different now in quarter two than I was in quarter one? A lot has changed in my business since quarter one. So some of those ways of thinking and ways of being are not going to work for quarter three and quarter four of this year. So that's why I emphasize coming in here regularly is going to, it's going to help you. Um, it sounds like, did, did anybody want to add something? I hear somebody speaking up. Uh, no. Okay. I'm going to move along here then. Okay. So I don't know about you, but I can, I can, I think I can assume that you as integrative health practitioners probably got into this because you really want to help people. How many people came in because you thought this was going to be the best way to make money? Probably not many, right? That's, integrative health is, is not exactly the best way to make money. You can make really good money, but you know there might be some professions where it might be a shorter path, right? So you're in this to help people. And you may have been turned off, actually. I, I, I don't want to assume this, but you may have been turned off by... Uh, you know, how financial success has been modeled in our modern society, right? We don't have a lot of great mo role models for what, what I call functional prosperity would look like, right? So I invite you to dream, to envision what could that look like? And maybe, maybe you already have some idea. Maybe you are already living some form of how you would describe functional prosperity, now, I'd like to get a little more specific. In your ideal lifestyle, what would, you, what would your work-life balance look like? So um, bear in mind this, I invite you to like pull down all the barriers. Like if money was not a thing, you know, if, you know, if, if you didn't have any limitations, geography, family, what, whatever, of course, family is going to be part of your equation if that's part of your vision for functional prosperity. But what if you could have your druthers and have anything that you wanted? What would that look like? How many hours a day would you be working? How many days per week would you be working? What hours during the day would you be working? And what days of the week? And it doesn't have to be the same days every week. You know, you can work Monday through Thursday and take Friday off. You can do that once a month rather than ever, all four weeks if you need to drive revenue a little bit or if you're hustling. Um, I've seen folks do these really creative, cool things where you can have uh, a four-day work week and have a four-day weekend every other weekend. So you work Monday through Thursday, week one, week two, you work Tuesday through Friday. That gives you a four-day weekend and then you have a two-day weekend alternating between each other. You can do the same thing with a three-day work week. With a three-day work week, you can do that and have a six-day weekend every other week. 
Now that would be maybe really cool for somebody who wants to take longer trips, you know, like camping or, or, or going places, you know, and say, you wouldn't be able to do that so easily, even on a three day work weekend. So um, I invite you to get creative here. Okay, how much time would you allot per year for downtime, for retreats, for travel, um, retreats? That, that I'm kind of implying self-care here because, you know, the, we carry a lot of weight. You know, integrative health professionals carry a lot of weight, and it's important for us to be have our batteries fully charged, right? Okay, so, you know, would, it, would, would you be um, on 40 weeks a year, 45 weeks a year, 50 weeks a year? What would that be? Maybe even write down the dates of like when you would be taking time. And then you can kind of back into how many weeks you would need for, um, for downtime. How would you want to feel after a day of work within your ideal work-life balance? Again, reticular activating system. Like what is the experience? What is the flavor that we want to have, the emotional flavor that we want to have after? Do we, do we want to feel like, burnt out? Probably not. And so, you know, if, if you're in a place in your business and you're feeling totally exhausted after every day, at least if you have an anchor, you, you have an anchor in your vision of what you would like it to be, we, we have a sense that, okay, this doesn't have to be how it is. We know that we're working towards a goal and we're not quite there yet. And it helps us get into the maybe more proactive role of you know, feeling some agency. Okay, I can I can tip the needle here. This is something that I can change. I'm work. Okay, I'm not I'm not always going to want to feel exhausted after every day of work, but you know, maybe for the next three months because I'm starting up, or because I'm going through an intense growth phase right now, I'm going to bear with this, right? But this is a phase. We're working out of this, and by you know, October, November, I think we're going to be out of it. Whatever it's going to be, right? But at least we're anchored in where we're heading. That's going to help. We know what we're looking for. Okay, so what else? Feel free to embellish here. If you have anything aside from these questions, uh, what your vision of success might look like, feel free to add in this section here. And this, this last part of this section is what I call a sensory bath. I invite you to engage your senses. What would be some of the sounds or the smells or the tastes or even the tactile sensations that might be associated with your vision of success. So for instance, if your vision of success was to take four weeks every year in say a beach in Florida or volunteering for a clinic in Africa, what would, what would that look like? Would you be feeling the sand grit between your toes on the beach? What drink would you be sipping? What meals would you be eating? Would you be in Mexico eating, uh, you know, enchiladas? Or, you know, where, mm, what would the sun look like? What would the air smell like, mm -hmm. right? What would the air feel like? Would it be humid? Would it be dry? This may sound airy-fairy, but it's making the experience very real for your nervous system. And there's something metaphysical here, I believe, too. And I can't define that. No, science isn't there yet. So the other thing that we, you know, I see a lot, I see happen quite a bit with practitioners is they are comparing themselves to what success looks like rather than defining what success looks like for themselves, right? Thank you for naming that, Jeremy. <laughs> Gosh, yeah. So th that's the benefit of this exercise that you can really differentiate. If your version of success is to be very simple, Maybe you don't need to be that six-figure practice. Maybe you can get by just fine with, you know, 5000 a month. Mm -hmm. And you have very low overhead and you can travel and you can be in Mexico where cost of living is really low or something like that. You might, you might have a much higher quality of life than somebody who's got, uh, you know, a million-dollar business, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, anything else you want to mention on that, Jeremy? No, I, I mean, I think that unfortunately people, you know, come into this and then they look at, they, you know, they're too often um, peppered with what success looked like to be a successful practitioner, which is mm -hmm. a busy clinic and, 
you know, all this other stuff when, you know, success for an individual who, um, you know, may not have the pressure of being the primary earner in a household just wants to work with people and yeah. be successful and being able to focus and spend quality time with less clients, but more beneficial. I think it's important for people to kind of acknowledge that and accept that. And that that's what success is for you as an individual. I mean, we talk about individualized health, right. And the importance of everything that that's there as an individual, yeah. but we don't consider that in our business as well, that each business can look very different and success can look very different for each one. I love this. I, I so love what you're saying here. Yeah. Being able to individualize the way that we approach our businesses. It, and it's so common, you know, a lot of folks go for, you know, business trainings, business courses, where there are these more, you know, when you're, when you're teaching in mass, you really kind of have to give a formula which is by definition kind of cookie cutter, right? And it's not always easy to kind of separate the wheat from the chaff to see what's for me, what's not for me. And especially if you're not that experienced in business, you just kind of take, pe take people for the weight of, you know, their authority and their reputation. So this, you know, hopefully this exercise will give you clarity on that. And, you know, gosh, you know, we're all on social media, most of us are, and, and you see, you know, you see a lot of different stuff on social media. It's easy to kind of get into that mode of comparing. Yeah, that's the thing. yeah. Um, just kind of building on that same idea on the social media side is, you know, somebody who maybe is moving into the space and doesn't know anything about social media, but they feel like they have to be present on social media without actually considering what they're trying to do. Totally. Yeah, so, you know, just kind of coming back to harp on the benefits of doing this kind of exercise is getting really clear on what you want. And you can begin to differentiate. You can kind of read between the lines when you see somebody else's business and lifestyle of what it is that they might be wanting. And you can contrast like, OK, it, that for them, their version of functional prosperity looks like that. Mine looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. So. And, and being rooted in this is what will help you when you get advice from outside people as to what they think you might should or should not be doing in your business, right? So, you know, just a quick example to kind of flesh this out. I think this is valuable. Um, when I was first exploring Ayurveda as a field, I talked to a few practitioners. There's this one practitioner down in uh, New Mexico. And she had a, she was very successful. She was doing Ayurveda and I think some kind of like a polarity therapy and, you know, busy practice. She actually just came out of the gate running. She did some Groupons and she had a full load of clients pretty much right away. So kind of out of the gate success is, is pretty remarkable, but she wasn't charging a lot of money. You know, she's, she's charging maybe 70 or 90 an hour, somewhere in that range. And she had been told by other people, other, you know, marketing consultants, like, you should really charge more. Mm -hmm. And she was very clear. She's like, you know, I have everything that I need. I live very simple, you know, and, you know, I don't need to charge more. And, you know, that may have been part of her success that like people could actually feel that they could reasonably afford their service, her services consistently. And she did quite well. So, you know, that's the benefit of having this clarity. Okay, so speaking of pricing, doing this section will actually help inform your pricing down the road. This is lifestyle requirements and visions. And, and what we're doing here is we're actually defining three categories or tiers of lifestyle in terms of uh, financial numbers. So how many people here know what your monthly nut is? I'm not going to ask you what it is, but how many people know what your monthly or even monthly nut? That's kind of like accounting jargon. Yeah. <laughs> right. So monthly nut is what you need to get by, right? What you need to cover your bills, cover your expenses on the personal side. So knowing your monthly nut is what informs how much you pull from your business to pay for yourself, but to pay yourself. It also informs how much you need to grow your business that you can adequately pay yourself, right? So the three tiers are this, survival, what do I need to survive? Very basic expenses, comfortable, and then expansive. And this is a framework that I borrowed from Barry Tesler. Uh, she's written a book and has a one-year one course called Art of Money. And she's, she's amazing. She's this... Uh, 
she's a financial therapist, actually. She works in this intersection between financial literacy and emotional literacy. I'm not going to go on too much raving about her, but I'll just say she's worth checking out. And, uh, and this is where the framework stems from. Taking a little bit further and, and actually using this as a framework to define how you would price your services based on these various tiers of lifestyle. And, and I can give you a glimpse on that, but that would be potentially another session if, if you all want to do another chat in the future. Mm -hmm. So um, here, very basically, what are your basic survivor need, survival needs? I would actually list them out you know, in terms of rent, um, insurance, vehicle, you know, all the various things, the bills that you pay on a monthly basis, and bills you might pay on an annual basis, like property tax and stuff like that. You know, if you're paying an annual insurance premium, list that here. And you'd kind of divide those by 12 in order to kind of like boil down your monthly nut. So what do you need to survive? Define that. You know, based on that, how much do you need to make in order to support that lifestyle? Same exercise, same thing to go through with a comfortable lifestyle. What would the comfortable lifestyle look like? What would you be doing differently? What would you be doing on top of your comfort, uh, on top of a um, survival lifestyle? Where would you be living? Would you be living in the same neighborhood or in the same kind of house? Or would you maybe have something with an extra bedroom or two or some more square footage? Would you, would you have a second house? Would you take another vacation? Uh, would you eat out more? Would you buy more of a certain kind of food or item or clothing? So what would that look like? Flesh it out, define that. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You know, just, just even like getting the wheels turning is really the key ingredient here, starting to think in these terms. So, you know, there's always going to be a first draft. The first draft's never going to be complete or totally accurate, but, you know, this is an iterative process. So based on that, what would your comfortable lifestyle look like? You know, it, you know, I'm just going to throw out some numbers here for maybe for a survival income for somebody who's single, you know, maybe it's 3000 a month, uh, you know, here in rural Oregon where cost of living is, well, it's, it's higher than the Midwest, but, you know, maybe you can get by in 3000, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas a comfortable living, you know, it may be 6000, you know, if you've got a family, it's, it's probably going to be double that, right? At least. Okay, and then you got your expensive lifestyle. And just imagine if money wasn't a barrier, if you didn't have to say no to things that you legitimately, legitimately wanted or needed or things that you felt your family legitimately, legitimate wants and needs, what would that look like? You know, would you have kids in private school? Would you have a college fund? Um, so, so think big, you know, and, and here you might start to notice discomfort come up. And I invite you simply to notice it. Just noticing, huh, oh, interesting. When I think about having a second house or a property, all my shoulds come to the surface. Oh, you shouldn't do that. Or that would be greedy or, or whatever it is. So we're noticing, we're starting to notice these invisible barriers. It could be a, an earning ceiling. And just mapping that out, having that on the map can be so powerful. Again, this is something that Barry Tesla talks about. And if we were to do another session on pricing, we would go deeper into, into that subject. So that's more on this sort of personal lifestyle visioning. Now let's go into some of the bigger business questions. These are questions that I love. Uh, I love a powerful question. Uh, and uh, these are actually from a book by Warren Berger, uh, a book called A More Beautiful Question. And in his book, he talks about how some of the biggest uh, companies out there were formed and premised on this simple question, companies like Apple even. <laughs> and uh, I can't remember some of the other ones, but uh, it's, not, it's not fresh in my memory, but this is powerful stuff, right? Just formulating a, a you know, a precisely formulated question can, can help you steer a ship through the Arctic Sea, literally. And, and ships are actually doing it these days. I don't, I don't know if you realize that. Ships are actually going through the Arctic Sea. Okay. So what, does, what is your business's purpose here on Earth? 
you know, is, is your business merely a means to a paycheck? Or is there a deeper reason behind the existence of your business? And, and realize that your, your business's purpose is probably going to be linked to your personal purpose. You know, you probably, I, 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 I believe that most people who are in, if not all people who are in integrative health, have a higher calling that brings them into this field. And, you know, you may have multiple callings here in this life. And being an integrative practitioner may be one of those, right? But you may have others as well. But your business is specifically linked to your calling as an integrative health professional. So, you know, what is, what is your business's reason for existing? And, and notice, you know, when you ask the question of like, what's my personal purpose? Notice, you know, in a Venn diagram kind of way, what's different in your personal purpose and mission from your business's purpose and mission? And where is the commonality? There's probably going to be a lot of overlap, a lot of commonality. But as you get bigger in business, it's going to be even more important for you to define your business as its own separate entity from your own self and from your own personal mission. Because at some point, if you're really successful, you might want to have an exit plan. You might want to have an exit strategy where you could potentially sell that business or hand it off to um, a partner or a family member. Okay, so who must you and your business fearlessly become? So this comes back to those identity updates, right? This challenge will uh, challenge you to envision a version of your business that doesn't currently exist uh, and a version of yourself that may not currently exist. So envisioning what might a new way of being for myself be? You know, what, what, what skills might I, might I need to develop in order to be truly able to actuate this vision? And, you know, human development doesn't stop when we become an adult. You know, I think that's a common misconception. We're constantly developing, right? And if we're not, then we're stagnating in some way, right? So, uh, you know, this is another thing that I love about the integrative health profession, that most of us are invested in personal development in some way. So who is it that we need to become? What skills do we need to develop? What, and what aptitudes do we need to develop? What is, what is true about your business at its core? So having a clear answer to this question can help you navigate some of the major challenges and changes that your business may face. Um, because you know, this is like your anchor. There's a story, actually. Uh, this, this is a story from the book Culture Code by Daniel Coyle. If you have team, a, a team in your business, you have, if, if you have multiple members in your clinic, I would highly, highly recommend this. This is a book about some of the most highly effective teams in the world, some of the most high, like, highly effective businesses in the world. It's really about how culture is way more important than strategy. Now, um, having a core of your business defined, that's, that's strategic, but it will help you to, um, when you're challenged, you'll need to be able to access that and orient to that. So gosh, this story is kind of, I'm, I'm gonna sketch it out. This was a drug company, maybe in, uh, I don't know, maybe the 80s, early 80s, maybe late 70s. It, it might've even been um, ibuprofen or some headache drug. But anyway, they put something out on the market and all these people were having like really negative reactions to it. And it was a big problem. It was embarrassing. Can you imagine having a company that put out a product that was getting all these people like wickedly sick? So these guys were like, man, you know, what do we do? Like, there's obviously a moral obligation to go public and do a recall of these products that are hurting people, right? But is that gonna sink the company? Are they basically cutting off their own head by turning themselves in? So they went back to their core values that were defined back in the 50s. So the core values were that we are in service of the public, of the doctors, of the patients through these products that we're creating. Very, very simple. And no one in the company really took it that seriously. It was just like one of these mission statements that's like, okay, that sounds nice, right? But they, or the CEO oriented to that core principle of their business to decide this, this debacle of a decision 
they risked, you know, basically, you know, they, there was a catch line too. They would have been darned whatever they chose, but they decided to go public and confess to, you know, to the media what was going on. They did this recall. And as a result, the public actually ended up trusting them more. Yeah. So when you're clear on your core values and what you bring to the table, it makes it way easier to navigate these very complex situations. It gives you a moral compass. And it saved his company. Their company is doing really well. I, I have to look it up to find out what company that was. So what's true about your business at the core? What, what are the core values? And, and maybe even defining what business are we even in? For you as integrative health professionals, it's, it's probably going to be clear you're in integrative health, but you know what type of integrative health? Are you only doing group sessions? Are you only doing one-on-ones? Is there certain things that you will do and you won't do, right? What if your business did not exist? Who would miss it most? And this is a question. So here's my uh, entrepreneurial vulnerability. How many people, and, and so I'm, I'm gonna say what it is and I'm gonna ask you. Um, even in business after three years, sometimes I'm like, gosh, why am I even in business? Should, should I just go get a job working for somebody else? I could probably earn six figures working for somebody else, but is this worth it, right? And so that's the mind. You know, the, the process of the mind is to question things. To, and, you know, doubt is sort of built into the way the mind works. So just normalize that. How many people have ever struggled with that as an entrepreneur? Is this even worth it? Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So it, I think every entrepreneur has faced that at some point. This is the question that helps. This is the antidote to that. If we didn't exist, who would miss it? You know, it's as if, if we have something really valuable to offer the world, we have a moral obligation to uh, provide this to the people that need it most, right? Are there certain people in the world that are, you know, they could get it from somebody else, but they're not going to get it quite in the same way, right? So having clarity on this can, can really help keep that motivation fresh of why you're in business and what you're in it for. What should you stop doing in your business? This is a question I think we don't ask enough, right? There's a tendency in business development to just take on another thing, take on another thing. Take, and we, you know, there's this 80-20 principle. Are you, are you all familiar with the 80-20 rule or Pareto's principle? That, you know, if we're taking on many things, we may lose sight of what that 20% of our business is actually producing 80% of the results or 80% of the revenue, right? So taking inventory of this periodically is, is really crucial and being willing to let go without having too much sentimental attachment to these things is, is really, uh, it's for the good of our business. Just like a healthy tree, it needs to be pruned periodically. Otherwise, you know, if I don't know if you all have apple trees or seen that, sometimes the, the branches can break under the weight of the apples. It's got too many apples on that branch and it wasn't formed properly right? So the business models can break in similar ways uh, when it becomes too weighted in, in weak areas. So Bill, there's a new book out called TEDx is Easier Than 2X. That's so funny. I was just talking with another consultant about that this morning. Yeah, we saw Dr. Yeah. Dr. Ben Hardy talk about that book and his, his concept is what's your 80%? What's okay. the 80% you need to shed to focus on the 20% that's going to get you to where you want to go? Uh, the exact same concept. And he actually goes through quite a few examples of different businesses where they have kind of filtered out the 80% and focused on the 20 and then had more, much more fruitful kind of businesses going forward. Wow. Love it. Yeah. That's a sign. I haven't read the book. I'm familiar with the principle. Uh, I really like Perry Applefield. What's his name? No, Perry, uh, Perry Marshall's work uh, in this. And then he's got tons of examples too. You know, it could be 80% of your business or 20% of your business. It, you might even just look at your client list. Like, who are, who are the customers that are driving the most revenue for your business? There's probably a 20% in there. And, and I don't know if Ben talks about this. This is, but this really took it to another level for me. This is something that Perry talks about. Is there's a 20% within the 20%. Mm -hmm. And there's a 20% within the 20% within the 20%. This is like an exponential thing. It's like fractals, right? 
So what that means is out of, if you have 100 clients, 80% of your revenue might be coming from 20% of those people. And out of those 20% of the people, you might have 80% of their revenue coming from, you know, so 20 people. There may be five people that are producing 80% of that revenue. Mm -hmm. And out of those people, there might be one person who's producing 80% of that. So you know, we're talking about like one out of 100 one of those people might actually be driving 50 or 60 or 70% of your business's revenue. You know, in, in integrative health, it may not be quite as drastically defined. You know, these, these principles of imbalance, it can range from 60 to 80 or 90% in, in terms of like the stratification. Um, but, you know, the, the essential principle is that there is this principle of imbalances and leveraging those imbalances in a way that works towards your favor is, mm -hmm. is a way to scale your business uh, dramatically. So, and I think to that point, that's where people get trapped, right? Is when you're brand new, you want to take a hundred percent of the people that you come to you, right? And it's only later do you determine who is, who's, who's the actual one out of five or the two out of 10 that you really want to work with. And then how do you kind of refocus your efforts. And then every, and in that book, they kind of talk about the continually focusing in on the 20% as you kind of evolve to, to getting to your long-term vision. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really glad that you're pointing this out, that there's phases in business, right? In the beginning of your business, you, you probably, you may not even know what you really love doing yet. You may have to try some things, right? So I, I think it's important to give yourself permission to like, you know, ex experiment, and even later in business, it's still worth having, you know, R&D, you know, experiment, research and development, try things, you know, you might discover something. But yeah, you know, with the focus of like still finding that and it may, it may be, you know, evolving into that second stage of business, like, okay, now we have consistent revenue. How can we dial this in even more? Yeah, uh, I think it's really important to define who your ideal client is that brings you joy. Work with the ones that give back to you, not that you just give so that you maintain that energy and you can continue to do what you love and it doesn't become a burden and a job. I love that, Connie. And I so <laughs> I, I just thank you for that's such a valuable contribution because, you know, it's really when we're looking at metrics like 80, 20, that's a soft metric, right? That's not that's not going to show up on a financial statement. Who's creating the most joy for you? But you might start to think in terms of that, like you could actually create metrics of like, hey, on a scale of one to 10, how passionate am I about working with this person, right? Or, or with this condition, it may not just Why? be, what's that? What gave me the joy, right? Yeah, what, what is it? Exactly, there it is. There's the question, yeah. wonderful. So these are awesome contributions. Just a quick time check. We have like five minutes left. So I wanna make sure that we, cover everything you want. I see a couple of questions as well too, so. Okay, cool, yeah, I'll, I'll just breeze through this last section. This is where getting into the nitty gritty. This is defining out what would your business or what could your business look like in 10 years? This is your 10, 10 year vision. I realize 10 years is like pretty far in the future and it's just very hazy. What, 10, 15 years, somewhere in there, what might it look like? If it hurts your brain too much or you just feel stifled, you can't really go that far into the future, that's fine. But, you know, in this, again, this is rough sketch, rough draft, just like playing in the canvas, playing in the sandbox. What could it look like? Mm -hmm. Defining services, where would you be located or would it be virtual? What kinds of team members might you have? Um, other relevant details, what would your revenue roughly look like? And what would you be paying yourself? And if that's too, if that hurts your brain too much, just skip straight to the three-year goals at least try to map out where you want to be in three years in terms of what services you're potentially offering, where you're located, other relevant details, team members. It might just be you and a VA, a virtual assistant. Maybe you have a medical assistant um, or a nurse or something like that. Um, revenue, take home pay, and then you got your one-year goal. Same, same process. Um, all these details, revenue, take home pay. And then from there, from the one-year goal, we're going to break down what are the major rocks that we need to push these milestones in order to get from where we are now to 12 months from now. And just, you know, putting these major objectives into 
what are we going to accomplish in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four? Now that we're, you know, we're at the halfway point in the year, which is kind of like a nice time to reflect back on the last two quarters. Maybe we'd start with quarter three, quarter four, and then put one, quarter one and quarter two below that for 2024. And I advise you to not pick more than three uh, major objectives, because if you become di too diluted in like big major projects, uh, it may be that you're just getting each of them halfway done and nothing fully done. And then you just have everything spilling into the next quarter. So general practice, uh, three major objectives, and you might be able to combine some of them. So uh, last section here is just identifying some of the key challenges that you're currently facing in your business and brainstorming some remedies that might serve as antidotes to these challenges. And that's basically it. You know, there's some goodies at the bottom here. You're welcome to check those out on your own. Feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions on this. I'm gonna put my email in chat and yeah, let's open it up for questions. Stephanie, you had a question in there. <laughs> And I know Bill's written about it for us, so far away. Oh, okay. I love this question. I apologize for getting off topic, and you don't have to answer it here, but I went to your website to check you out. Thank you. <laughs> right on. And, and so you saw my blog, right? Is, I did. Is there a way to make QuickBooks compliant or not? No, there's not. Um, okay, that's all you need to say. I don't want to take up this group's time on that. Well, I think it's, I love, first, I, I love that you're asking this question because, you know, as much as, you know, health professionals, we learn about HIPAA, um, I don't hear a lot of people talking about it with specific softwares, especially accounting software. So it gets missed. I see, unfortunately, a lot of folks missing the mark on this. So what you do is you probably have an EHR or maybe you're using Biocanic. That would be where you have your sales data, right? And, and those are HIPAA compliant platforms. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, when you take payments, what, what payment processor does Biocanic use, Jeremy? Uh, well, we, so it would be the practitioners doing okay. processing, right? So Okay, they have their own payment processor? Right. But okay. some, we have, we have talked to some clinics that were using QuickBook, QuickBooks for direct invoicing to a patient. Okay, gotcha. So, you know, so Biocanic, I mean, this is my ignorance, so I apologize. Biocanic does not... Um, that doesn't actually process charges for people. Is that right? Or yeah. So the practitioner is using their own system with it. So if you're using an EHR in combination with Biocanic, you would run charges through your EHR. Um, otherwise, Square is a HIPAA compliant payment processor. I recommend that. And what Square will do is it will deposit into your bank account lump sums from daily sales. So you'll just see like $542 deposited in your bank account on Wednesday. And you won't see any patient names. And that's all you keep in your QuickBooks. You don't, you, I basically have one client or one customer name in QuickBooks and that's general patient. That's what I do for my clients. And so uh, if you ever, if you need more specific revenue detail, you go to the HIPAA compliant platform to see mm -hmm. that whether it's Square or the EHR. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but listen, it, we're kind of at time. Uh, do you want to kind of talk about what you have coming up and then we'll wrap this up? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I have a webinar coming up actually tomorrow. Uh, it's an interview with, uh, gosh, I love this guy. His name is Tad Hargrave. He calls his business Marketing for Hippies. He's a hippie true and blue. He used to work for some of the big time marketers way back in the day, and he forgot how to be a hippie. So he learned how to be a hippie again, and now he's teaching folks who are doing great and work in the world how to market their businesses effectively. He's got a lot of holistic folks in, in his circle, and Gosh, he, he's, he's a brilliant, brilliant marketer. And I, I don't really see anybody out there. I've, I've done a lot of marketing training, spent thousands of dollars. And he has a way of articulating marketing principles to heart-based entrepreneur, entrepreneurs that is unmatched. So I'm going to be interviewing. He gives his best stuff for free. And you know, his membership is ridiculously affordable. I would highly recommend checking out his work. Uh, if you're if you're doing any kind of copy, blogging, finding clients, um, designing a website, any of that, uh, he'll help you get clarity on how to define your message in a way that uh, attracts your ideal clients. So I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. I put a link in chat, don't I? I need to find that link. Well, I'm gonna. Here's your website. You, you dropped your email in there. We'll make sure to link this up uh, on the posting as well, um, and then. 
Yeah, I think I saw it on LinkedIn, right? Yeah, it was on LinkedIn. Exactly. I didn't. I, I should have had that ready at the at the gun. And uh, but, feel free yeah. to email me or find me on LinkedIn if you need that. If you'd like to check out that event, we're going to do a recording, so I'll send those out afterwards. Awesome. Well, this has been great, Bill. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Um, and your info is there. Well, like I said, we'll link back to everything in the post so people who watch this recording can reach out to you. We'll also share the link for this document. That's okay, right? Please do. Yeah, please uh, you know, use this document to your heart's delight. If you'd like further guidance on this, I'm happy to offer you all a 30-minute free coaching call to kind of walk through it with you, give you some extra tips, um, you know, anything you want for that 30 minutes, you have my time and attention. So I'm uh, happy to be a service. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you yeah. for everybody for, for coming here today and, and uh, creating space for, for me to share this message that I'm passionate about. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. And Jeremy, can I ask you a quick question? Yep. On coming up in July, is the thing with Connie and Lanny a brand new thing or is that yes. been going on and I just didn't know about it? No, we just started it. Um, so that'll be every two weeks on Tuesday. And we're just going to, and if you have questions on like, hey, I want to implement stuff, like we just had our call this morning. Uh, so like the next one, if, if people have questions, we'll go through it together in terms of like best practices and implementation. But like we get a lot of questions around, hey, I use Canva to create my documents and I want to be able to put those into Biocanic. So we'll be covering like the tips and tricks of how to be able to better implement and match those things as well. But anything that any questions or, hey, I'm working through something, I'm building a program, I'm not quite sure what's the best way to do that. You know, we we work with all of our clients and, and customers, so we kind of know what works uh, and the tips and tricks that you may not see in kind of the training video. So that's the goal there is just a real kind of engagement just to go through our, our particular features and implementation stuff. Gotcha. And if I can just do a quick announcement, if anybody knows of a doctor that participates in insurance that would like to see POTS patients and be listed on a statewide directory, please share my email with them and Perfect. I'll put it here. Uh, we're getting ready to do a national advertising campaign. Awesome. And then we'll make sure to link that out as well, too. So, oh, and uh, Stephanie, feel free to post that in the practitioner announcements as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank yeah. you very much, Bill. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks. All right, y'all. Have a good rest of the day. Take care. Thanks. Thanks.